You're listening to the Compassion Fatigue Podcast with your host, Jennifer Blau. This is Session 30. Hello and welcome and thank you as always for joining me on the Compassion Fatigue Podcast. My guest today is Stacy Horn. She is a licensed clinical social worker and hypnotist based out of Colorado. Stacy is a personality expert and she is here today to talk all about how personality and temperament can possibly play into compassion fatigue and what we can do about it. Stacy is particularly passionate about helping introverts restore their energy and she currently works with individuals, groups, and companies to discover how their inner kinetics are the foundations for a lasting solution to people problems and challenges. Challenges, focusing on the individual's core strengths and how those can benefit and strengthen the group. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Stacy Horn. Hi, Stacy. Welcome to the Compassion Fatigue Podcast. How are you? Good. Thanks for having me, Jennifer. Absolutely. So I am so geeked about this <laughs> conversation today. I think this topic is just really fascinating, and I think it's going to help to shed light on people like me and my audience members and why we do the things we do. We are so compelled to help animals, but you know, sometimes that can get us into trouble and we can end up kind of burning out or end up with compassion fatigue, hence this podcast. And and hence this, this really cool topic. And that is all about our own personalities and temperaments. But you know, Stacy, I think a lot of times those words get used kind of interchangeably. Can you start by telling us the difference between personality and temperament? Yes. You know, and as you started out, I think it's important for us all to understand who we are and what drives us, what motivates us. And I think for your audience, I think some of that understanding will certainly help in managing emotional reactions as well as understanding oneself. And yeah, there's a lot of mis there's a lot of information out there. Some of it's really good. Some of it's really tied to specific psychological theories. But basically, temperament is our inner design, which honestly has been observed and studied for two and a half millennia. It actually shows up, and, and I am in no way a scholar, but it actually shows up very early in um, one of the books of the Bible, Ezekiel, as the four faces of humanity. So it's been being observed since then. Uh, but temperament is our core strength. And nurses actually can see it in infants in the nurseries and pretty much gets about 80% accuracy within 48, 24 to 48 hours after birth by looking at how babies respond. So this is our wiring. It's present from birth. And I believe, we believe that it doesn't change. Babies who are SP temperament are very active. Babies so I, I'm going to stop you right there. What, okay. what, is, what is S, for those who okay. don't have psychology degrees, yes. what is SP, what does that stand for? Okay. So temperament is looking at four aspects. I'm going to focus on two aspects right now, which is the core. One is S, which is sensory, people who take in information through their five senses. And T, which is people who take in information through a gut sense a sixth sense, if you will. And the second aspect of that is a little take draws from two different areas. P is perceiving, is, is how it's being seen, judging or perceiving, J or P. And that is actually, we everyone does that, so we just call it J and P. But someone who is SP is someone who takes in information through their five senses and also likes to keep their options open as far as decision making, lifestyle preferences, J and P. And so that's someone who is a little bit more relaxed, very spontaneous in the moment. A lot of crisis workers are fall into that category or are wired that way. The second is SJ, which is sensory, taken through the five senses, and J is driven, like to make a decision and move on, feels a sense of pressure in their gut most of the time to move. NT, which is intuitive, taken through a sixth sense. And this one actually has a tie to decision making. 
Decision making is either analytical, make ABC, those are the facts and we move on, or it's all of that decision making analytical and how do I feel about it? So feelings of ourselves and others weigh in heavily on our decision making process. So intuitive analytical and intuitive and F feeling. Does that make sense? It, it does. And so before we move on to personality, you were saying that, so basically temperament from what you're saying is, is kind of like a blueprint, if you will, yes. um, that we're born with. And and so take us back to this, the babies. I think you were starting off yeah. saying that SP babies are very active. So yes. these are your kind of, you know, wiggly babies uh, yes. at, who are very alert and active at birth. And, yes. and so what are the other types? SJ, which are often seen as fretful and fussy. These are folks who are, uh, as I'll explain a little bit more, um, who end up being pretty duty bound. So a lot of their may often have um, stomach issues and there's a lot of, there's a little bit more pressure. So fretful and fussy is the way we begin and often that plays out through life. NT babies, which are often tech people and engineers, are very calm very observant, um, all about their heads. And NF babies, which I believe they're to be a pretty high people showing up in, um, in your audience in particular, are alert and very responsive, very sensitive to other people's emotions about people and about relationships. Would that include animals as well? It so very does. Okay, yeah. So it's just relational in general then? Yes. Yes. Cool. So I did that clarify it at all. It's yeah. kind of complicated. Yeah, I think so. And I, and I, I, I know each and every one of my audience members is going, okay, I'm, I might be an, an SP or I, I, I'm pretty sure I'm an NF. Uh, we'll get to that later. But it, yeah. you know, I think you're right. Probably a lot of uh, this audience are, are going to be NF personality types mm -hmm. or, or temperament types. And, and yes. so, okay, so now let's talk about personality because that, that's a whole new ball game, right? That's, that's yes. different than temperament. Yes. And, and this is where a lot of the confusion is, and this is where a lot of models, psychological models out there focus on, but personality is the result of life experiences, parents, family experiences, trauma, which all become layered on to our temperament. But it always goes back to temperament is the core, and that's when we're aligned with our core, our mission, our values, our urges and preferences, that's where we can be the best we can be. Our personality can evolve and develop over time and history, but when people go back to their core temperament, that's where they truly find their fulfillment, and that's typically, and, and live in their strengths, and that's where people, and I, again, I believe a lot of your audience are saying, yeah, I know that this is my calling, this is my passion, this is what I'm, this is where I'm coming from and that's why I do what I do. Oh yeah, I think for so many people, um, it's, it's more than a job. It's more than a volunteer position. It, it, like you said, it really is a passion, a calling. Mm -hmm. So okay. there's typically no coincidences when we fall into some of these careers. I'm going to throw out another couple of words that not everybody recognizes, but can you explain the difference between introversion an extroversion or yes. an introvert and an extrovert. Yes. This is another aspect that's really misunderstood. If you do a Google search, you're going to come up with millions of, of hits on this. But many people think that introversion or extroversion is about how social we are or not. But what it truly is, is extroversion is about getting our inner energy restored from other people and from the company of others and things outside of ourselves. Often need introspection as well, but extrovert is actually, this is an extrovert world. It's 75% of the population fall into extroversion. And introversion is about getting energy from inside ourselves. And it means typically some solitude. It means spending time getting lost in a book or a movie possibly. But extroverts, there's a, like an electrical cycle. Extroverts give energy to other folks and they draw energy from other people as well. Introverts give energy, but we have to go inside 
to restore our, our batteries. So small talk, party, social chatter can be very draining for an introvert, but very charged up and exciting for someone who's extroverted. And introverts are about 25% of the population. And so how, you know, this is something I've always wondered, how you you say that it's not so much about being social, but how would you describe someone that that views themselves as an introvert, but loves to be surrounded by nature, wildlife, animals, that type of thing? I, I would say that that makes perfect sense. Because again, that would be Connecting with nature, connecting with animals would be a could be a very soothing, restoring experience for an introvert. Okay, uh, so it's not necessarily being alone; it's no. it's being it's not being surrounded by other humans. Typically, yes, yeah. Okay, I think that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and and so are there. You touched on this a little bit, but do you think that there are certain personality types or, or temperament types mm-hmm. that tend to be drawn toward helping professionals uh, or helping professions such as animal care? Yes, I yes, I do. Um, in really thinking about it and listening to some of your podcast, I kind of did some re- additional research. And I believe that a lot of people who are drawn to animal care, one I think there's probably going to be a little bit higher number of introverts. And I also think that some, a lot of NFs, intuitive feeling people are drawn to animal care. I think SP temperaments are going to be drawn to animal care, in particular um, rescue and some of the more exciting in the moment pieces of the work. Mm, so your animal rescuers, your animal control officers, yes. people that love that adrenaline rush. Exactly. Okay. At least okay. that's that's my imagination, but I've yeah, I yeah. got a pretty educated imagination at this point. <laughs> um, and there's also people who are SJ. So SJ are people who find satisfaction doing duty. They're reliable. They're dependable. They're consistent. And they often find themselves in positions, introverted versions, um, of protecting people, taking care of loved ones, protecting those who cannot protect themselves. So I think those three are probably going to be the highest numbers that are showing up in in this profession, in these professions. And I'll flip out a couple quick numbers because I think it's kind of amazing. SPs are typically, they're about 40% of the population. Okay, and these are your your brave people, people who love excitement. Those are the yes. SPs. Mm-hmm. Yes, in the moment, um, uh-huh. often folks who end up getting diagnosed ADD because they're in the moment. Okay, so a little, <laughs> little less than half. But, yeah. Uh, okay. Mm-hmm. SJs, people who are about responsibility and duty, are about forty six percent of the population. NTs, which I think there's going to be a very a smaller amount because they're more analytical and typically are not really warm and fuzzy people. So won't be as emotionally available as I find most people in the animal care industries and professions are about 8%. So again, a pretty small percentage and NFs, I believe are probably pretty plentiful. And that's actually about 6% of the people who've taken these type of assessments. Okay, so it, it sounds like what you're saying is the NF type personality, while it's fairly rare in the general population, you, you, you're speculating that it, it's probably the majority in the animal care field. Yes, that's, Interesting. that's my guess. That's my guess. Okay. Yeah, I, I think I would have to agree with you there. I think that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And again, it's it, because it's a calling. Yeah, absolutely. And then, and so there's also, you've been talking, I believe, about the, and we're going to get a little psycho babbly on you for just a second. Bear with us. So <laughs> I believe you were talking about the inner kinetics adult temperament key. Yes. Is, is that correct? So yes. I know that there's that. And then there's also the, the Myers Briggs type indicator. Yes. Can you, without going overboard on the psycho babble, yep. can you explain what those are? Yeah. Myers Briggs is what many people are familiar with. It's it's been around pretty openly since the, I believe the eighties, and often when you go online, that's what you find. It looks at all four letters, which is which is important, which is useful. And interkinetics looks at the core of the temperament. 
The other aspects are, again, d- explaining our design and our strengths. So interkinetics is the model that I choose because I believe that it's a way of understanding why we prefer what we prefer and act the way we act. So it's useful in understanding ourselves as well as loved ones, children, co-workers. So those are, again, it's, it's just different ways of looking at things. But I find when we look at our core of who we are, we get the best sense of why we, why we get drawn into doing what we do and often how we're going to respond. And so can you kind of break down the letters as far as sure. like I versus E, S versus N, and, and what those mean? Yes. So the four aspects are I versus E, and that is what do we do to replace lost energy? We either connect with people or we go inside. Okay. So for my audience, energy is is always an issue um, yes. because a lot of us are running on empty. Um, yes. So does it matter if you're an I or an E, how you replace that energy? It does. Thanks. What a great question. Um, it does. And typically... What we know is that if we can, if we find ourselves typically a a perfect indicator of a low battery is often some irritability, in particular in people who aren't typically irritable, it might be a, a deeper sense of overwhelm. And often for someone who's experiencing that, if they're introverted, having 15, 20 minutes time by themselves to just be lost in their own head, go for a bike ride, go for a walk, all those self-care things that you talk about so often can be enough to restore that battery and allow us to come back and continue whatever task or responsibilities we might have. Someone who is extroverted, who finds himself becoming irritable for no reason, considering, you know, wow, if you ask yourself, where's my battery? You kind of get this funny little picture of a battery and how low or high it might be. Um, and someone who is more of an extrovert who finds themselves with a low battery connecting with people is, is the remedy to restoring that. I'm very much of an introvert. My daughter is very much of an extrovert. And um, honestly, this sounds really crazy, but to help her restore her battery on the weekends, Sometimes I take her to Costco uh, wow. um, because she, there's people, there's noise, you know, and, and for her, that restores her. And that would give me a stroke. That's, that's, yes, uh, it would. so, it Im- would. that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, it, that's how one of the little tricks that I've learned to help her manage. And she's, she's very, she's only nine. So um, it's not like she could go do that herself, but um, yeah. So it's my responsibility to make sure that, she does restore. And I think that's um, a powerful tool that we can use with our coworkers as well. And so it sounds like, you know, from what you're saying that in order to kind of restore our energy, it's really important that we look at self-care from a very personal point of view, right? So yeah. what might work for you and I taking a walk, being with some animals, being in nature, that might not do it for people who are more extroverted. They might need more kind of stimulation. Exactly. You know, it's so funny because we all go through the world and we kind of assume that everyone experiences it the same way. But what, what this body of um, research, observation, history, and as well as our personal experiences, yeah, we, we know that's not true. And when you start tuning into some of those differences, yeah, it, it really changes how we look at things and it certainly can change how we take care of ourselves. Yeah, so okay, so let's move on to yep. S, S or N. So S or N is how we gather information about the world outside of us. We take it in through our five senses, which is S, sensory, or we take it in through a sixth sense, which is intuitive. So I'm guessing that probably most of my audience, would you assume, would be N, since we probably, there's a certain energy um, between animals and people that I don't yes. think everyone picks up? Correct. Okay. Correct. And, and some of the other scent people do, but again, it's more through the touch than it is through the gut. So that's why I think there's, it would be really interesting to see in your audience, again, how do you, audience member, um, experience it? Okay. And then how about T or F? This is decision-making process. T is 
I make my decisions by facts, ABC, that's the facts, that's what I must do. Or we do that process and we take another step of how do I feel about it or how would other people feel about this decision? Sometimes people think it's either analytical or it's feeling, but it's, it's not. It's, it's both. Okay. And then finally, J or P. Which is lifestyle preference. Someone who's J likes to make a decision and move on. They may second guess it later, but feels best when they make a decision and have come to some closure there. Someone who's P, again, likes to keep the options open, collects information until they have as much information as they feel they need to make a decision. They make a decision and then they move on. No regrets. It's done. But again, it's a little bit slower process, a little bit more spontaneous process. Okay. So I am an INFJ. That is my uh, temperament or, or personality yes. uh, trait yeah. or style. Yes. How, would you, yeah. how, would you, how would you describe someone like me? Well, um, I also, that's also mine. So again, people who are INFJ often end up in as, as therapists, as coaches, as consultants, as helpers. And it's, but it's, it, that particular INFJ or INFP is another variation. It's actually only about one to 2% of all the population. Wow. And again, so it's really heavily weighted. We end up coming into these professions where we're helping people. Typically complex, warm, uh, very sensitive, both physically as emotionally. If you've ever heard the term highly sensitive people. Amen, um, sister. Yeah, that it's, I think there's a really, there's an overlap um, or an alignment is probably better. It's emotional. It's intuitive. It's very social because we like people and often people would miss, I'm guessing mistake you for, if they saw you out in the world, might mistake you for someone who's very extroverted. But it's about, again, goes back to restoring your battery. You like people, connect with people, but you need to restore those energies. By, by being alone or being in nature with animals can be drained by chaos, crisis, disharmony. Costco. Costco, absolutely. <laughs> Light noise, people. All about mind and reason, uh, the analytical piece, this particular combination, but it's always trying to help. Part of the drive is helping people to their potential. And it's very diplomatic. And... I often apologizes. That's the sensitivity. Apologizes when it's not really our place to make an apology, but wanting things to be smooth and comfortable. Hate disharmony. And the sensitivity also shows up when if we're hurt or we're empathically picking up on another person or an animal's hurt, we can be really quickly drained because it's very empathic. And empathy is stepping into someone else's pain with them. So we can do that very easily. And again, I think that's not good or bad. It's a vulnerability for folks who are working with people who are in great pain. And the other piece of it is we often take care of others before we take care of ourselves. So that combination makes us very vulnerable to compassion fatigue, I think. Oh, absolutely. And I think it also makes us vulnerable to other things such as depression or even burnout. Absolutely. Absolutely. Again, knowing ourselves is the way to manage, prevent, and combat some of those things that kind of come with the territory. So does that sound like you, Jennifer? Oh, you nailed it. You (laughs) you absolutely nailed it. And so for those of um, you who might be saying, well, maybe that's my personality type, but maybe that's not my personality type. Mm -hmm. How do other personality types or, or temperaments maybe make us more vulnerable to compassion fatigue because I'm guessing that each type probably has different vulnerabilities when it comes to compassion fatigue or even burnout. Exactly. And, and we all do. I think I'm going to go back to the SP because I started with that earlier. Um, due to the strengths, they're ultimate optimists. Being in the moment, the moment moves on and they go on to the next exciting thing. And I think when you see someone who's always, always optimistic and playful, 
become fatigued, it's often because they've also taken on some of the pain of someone else's and getting them out, being physical, focusing on action is the way to help them move through it. Again, using their strengths, which I think is the best way of helping people. People who are SJ, again, these are the responsible folks um, who are doing what what's right and focused and driven in that way. It's difficult when you're dealing with horrible things sometimes to not take on responsibility for things that aren't yours. So I think that's the vulnerability there. And being able to get clear on, no, that's not my responsibility. I didn't do this harm. I didn't do these bad actions. Um, So maybe for them, it's more about creating boundaries? Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Excellent reframe. Uh, um, (laughs) I'm a therapist. Yes. It's what we do. Yeah. Um, And and then for those who are, find themselves as NFs, um, again, that as you were expressing the, um, the empathy, being trusting, being sensitive, being able to be, again, it's boundaries, but being able to be really clear on is this my feeling or is this someone else's? Mm, okay. um, and being able to contain that. Um, I, I think often and teach people a lot about shielding. So that's, you know, our personal bubble, being able to be clear of my personal bubble is about how I, I'm feeling, what I'm experiencing, as opposed to someone else's. And kind of learning how to protect ourselves. And when you're dealing with people who are in pain, when you're dealing with animals who are in pain, making sure that you aren't taking it on, because if we aren't clear about that, if we aren't taking care of ourselves, yeah, we're compassion, fatigue, burnout are going to be a constant companion. And so what do you think that um, supervisors or managers can do because they are supervising or managing teams of, you know, a variety of temperaments and personalities? What is something that you think they can do to help combat compassion fatigue within the organization? I actually think that understanding who they have on their teams is really important so that they can support people in, in recognizing you know, how someone is, what someone is experiencing and offering them solutions like, you know, go outside, take a walk, why don't you go take some time by yourself, whatever is most appropriate for that individual. Developing culture in a way that people know that, oh my goodness, my whole team is experiencing fatigue as a result of these events or this individual experience and making it okay to talk about it. Being able to say, hey, I if you see someone doing this, or if you see this individual doing this, tell them to go take a walk. Tell them to, you know, that it's, that they aren't responsible for it. whatever. Again, it's, it's modeling and demonstrating self-care and making that part of the culture. And so again, when we talk about self-care, it's going to be very personal based on your individual temperament or personality. So for example, an INFJ uh, such as myself Mm -hmm. is really going to need to kind of get away from coworkers and and people in general, take a walk, be surrounded by wildlife and, and nature and things like that. But maybe your SPs are going to have to like focus on action type activities, right? Maybe something that's more a little stimulating or exciting to them. So it's, it's really a personal choice, right? Yes. So how do you think that various personality or temperament types can protect themselves against compassion fatigue and burnout? I think the, the aspect of introversion and extroversion is one clue. How do you feel when you're around someone that you can clearly see as extrovert? Do you feel charged up or do you feel drained? Um, I think that's one piece being able to check in, imagining where's my battery at, I think that's really important. And that's actually introversion and extroversion can be a big sticking thing in the workplace. So that's an important aspect of being aware of that. But understanding, taking a couple breaths and breathing through what's causing frustration for you. Is it these terrible things that you've seen today or this week? building up or is it people not being responsible knowing yourself enough to say okay wait i'm going to take a pause here what is really going on what is my gut telling me and whether that's 
your physical gut, whether that's your intestines and digestion, or whether that's just a gut sense, that's going to give you a really huge clue as to what you need to do next to take care of yourself. And, you know, and I'm speaking for myself, but also a lot of my own clientele, I think there is so much pressure with 75% of the world being extroverted. I think there's a lot of pressure to conform and to feel like um, you're kind of the uh, odd man out if you're an introvert. And so I see a lot of people trying to force themselves into this extroverted little box. Big but, box. Yeah, yeah, big box. <laughs> but, but you know, not everyone fits in that nice little yeah. pretty box. And so it sounds like, you know, if, if you are an introvert, you know, rock that out, right? I mean, just, yep. just accept yourself and find ways that are going to recharge you, not based on what society says you should do, because 75% are going to be recharged by going to Costco, yeah. right? And yeah. so you really have or to Walmart. find, oh, dear God. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and so you really have to find what, what does it for you, what, ch- what charges your personal battery. Yes. And, and, and again, I think it's really important to understand that you can actually recharge your battery as an introvert in 15, 20 minutes. You know, and again, as you said, it could be with animals, it could be walking, it could be with one or two other people that we're really comfortable with. But we require a relatively short period of time to recharge. So it doesn't have to be you take a, a day to go hike a mountain or ride a bike 100 miles or anything like that. It can be 15, 20 minutes, and we can come back and be present to whatever our tasks and responsibilities are. Sure. And, you know, you mentioned 15, 20 minutes. That's mm-hmm. something we can do on a lunch break. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So maybe you get recharged on your lunch on your lunch break by talking with your coworkers. Maybe you get recharged by taking a break from your coworkers, and that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Knowing what it is for, for us individually is, is the key to all this, I think. And so how can people learn about their four-letter type? They can do it in lots of ways. There's, like I said, there's lots of information on the internet, although the model that I use and, and that I most believe in is, is interkinetics, and they can go to the website, which is raywlincoln.com forward slash temperament key, and you can find out what this indicates both your temperament, the two letters, as well as the type is. And then you can find lots of information out there about it. And you can find information by reaching out to me as well. I think you'll have probably have it on your, your show notes. But my name is Stacy Horn, and my website is stacyhorn.com. Thanks, Stacey. I am definitely going to put those links on the show notes page at the CompassionFatiguePodcast.com. Uh, so for those of you who don't have access to your phone or computer right now, you can come back at a later time. And, and that's a free assessment, correct? Yeah. Yeah, it takes about 10 minutes. So it's, um, and it's, it looks at who we are as a person as opposed to who we might be in the workplace. So I think that's an important distinction as well. Yeah, that's awesome. So Stacey, is there anything else that you'd like to add? No, I just, I, I hope, if anything, that this inspires people to look at themselves and, and what really drives and charges them. Um, and I think that will really support people in, in taking care of themselves in some ways that perhaps they hadn't been aware of before. I agree, Stacy, And I think the more we can kind of look at ourselves and have some understanding of our, of our kind of innate temperament and our personality, you know, maybe the more self-compassion we can have for ourselves. And I, I think we could all use a little bit more of that, don't you? Absolutely. Some of us more than others, I think. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Thanks again, Stacy. This has been really fascinating, and I really appreciate you taking the time to come on today. Thank you again for having me as a guest. I, I, I love your podcast and you are an exceptional interviewer. So I think oh, your, too audience sweet. Is, your audience is getting the best of uh, everything. So. Oh, well, thanks, Stacy, yeah. And you have a great week. Thanks. You too. Take care. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Compassion Fatigue Podcast. Remember to head on over to iTunes and subscribe so you never miss a single episode. And don't forget to check out the Compassion Fatigue Podcast for more great resources, including a link to join our private Facebook group. Please note that this podcast is not meant to provide medical advice or substitute for psychological care. 
Please consult with a mental health professional if you need additional support. And if you are feeling suicidal, please go to your nearest emergency room or call 911.